That's not your mom. Hello, and welcome to this journey. Uh, I will be your humble host, as always, and uh, I'm Zachariah Adil. We are currently in the forest, somewhere in Dartford, near Dartford, something like that. And uh, this was organised by um, James. Well, James is running it, organised by Steve. Uh, and you will meet them later on in, on our little trip. But right now we are under the gazebo. Well, I don't know what you call it, but the music is it. The tent, just down underneath the tent. Uh, she probably, I don't know where she is. She's gone somewhere. She's run off somewhere. Bubbly! Oh, look how mucky she is already. We have We've literally just got here. Look at that. Oh God. You cheeky monkey. Um, so first things first. Hi, I'm James. For those who don't know, um, welcome to Camp Wild Time. Uh, we normally cater for kind of children and teenagers, so this, this is why there's going to be things around That's here that then. look a bit kind of child orientated. Uh, we don't often do stuff for adults because the way I see it is there's enough companies out there. I'm not worth my business isn't worth competing with the adult companies. Um, I'd rather work with the children. But you know, Steve has asked me to do something for you guys, and it's not that much out of my wheelhouse. The way I see it, if you can work with children, adults are a breeze. <laughs> uh, I've basically emptied my garage and bought everything I possibly could with me to give you guys absolute hands-on with everything. The way I like to learn is to get hands-on. Mm. There's no point me looking at pictures or looking at videos. I like to be able to touch and feel and play with it. So I want you guys to see that, okay? We've obviously got the fire in the middle, so please be careful when moving around camp. I don't want anybody being used as firewood. <laughs> um, from the top where the pond is, there's a stream that runs all the way through. It comes down through this section here, feeds down into another pond here, and then feeds down to further streams. The water is about yay deep. The mud is about eight foot deep. Oh. You fall in, you will vanish, and we may not get you back out again. There's been some very touch and go moments with young people down here. Um, so please, as you're around the edges of the water, just be careful, okay? If you do slip in, try and grab something on your way in. It'll stop you from going too deep, all right? So the main force will be food, fire, shelter, and water, okay? We're not gonna be doing any foraging. It's not my wheelhouse. Um, there are people that are professionals. I'm not a mycologist. I'm, I know what I know, and I'm comfortable with what I know. But I'm not. I'm not comfortable with teaching other people foraging. It's a difficult subject, foraging, and it's a really dangerous subject yeah, as well. Work. You can't live on tin food. The nutrition isn't there. You live in your bunker for more than a year, and rickets will kick in. Okay, you won't have vitamin. Enough vitamin D. The supplements won't last. You won't survive. Yeah. And not only that, once again, you've got to survive the human factor. What are people willing to do to you to ensure their survival? Yeah? And the whole idea of throwing a rucksack on your back and disappearing off into the, the Caledonian forest in Scotland and, you know, surviving, that's also wishful thinking. We are a pack species. You can't survive on your own. Nobody can know enough knowledge to live on your own. Yeah, there is always something you'll be lacking and that will be the thing that gets you. Yeah, and all it takes is one thing to go wrong and it's game over. There is that obviously, um, people say that our caveman ancestors uh, didn't live very long, you know, because they didn't have the health and the things like that. Our ancestors lived incredibly well. The difference was is they didn't have the NHS to fix a broken leg. So when a broken leg happened or a broken hand happened or a broken jaw happened, that was game over for them. Yeah, and they lived a much more robust life than we do. We live quite a soft and sedentary life, despite what you think. You think you're quite outdoorsy. You don't live the quite outdoorsy life that our ancestors lived. So that is something to factor in as well, that you know your medical knowledge needs to live in. And also, if the NHS does collapse and the really poo hits the fan and you haven't got that access, then you're in trouble. Because anything that goes wrong, you know, sepsis, you haven't got the medication by broken leg if you haven't got the skills and the knowledge or the medication by it's game over it's it's as serious as that and that's something that people don't like to think about they think it's all gonna be easy breezy I'll throw a few tins of soup in my backpack put my knife in my pocket and away I go it's not that simple yeah, because you've got to get to the end of your street first. So what's the answer? What's the answer? <laughs> the answer is you've got to be prepared as the best you can, but you also have to understand the realities of what is actually likely going to happen. Yeah, 
And I know that seems extreme, but it's not as simple as just going, oh, well, you know, I'll just live in my Anderson shelter in the garden. That won't be a problem. Yeah, okay, fine. All right, then, you crack on. Yeah, and we have to think that way. So it may be making some life shifts. If it's that important to you, you need to make shifts in your life now as opposed to when it happens. And that could be as much as moving away from the major cities. Yeah, it could be, you know, having a decent bug out spot or having a second home somewhere that when things start looking a bit dodgy, you disappear off somewhere else to think about those kind of things. Those are, th you have to make those life shifts now, not when the poo hits the fan. Yeah, when the poo hits the fan, it's too late. Yeah, and that's, that's something you need to think about. Yeah. So um, you're talking, sorry, you're talking about buying a bit of land like with a few properties on it or buying Yeah, or I, bet, I mean, or... I mean, you, I can poke holes in most scenarios. You know, if you did that and you moved into the middle of nowhere in Wales, say for example, and bought a load of land and put some houses on it, what's the first thing anybody who's going to think that who manages to get out of the cities? Where are they going to go? They're going to go to the top of a hill and go. Shit, there's a load of buildings down there. It looks like a load of people down there. Guess where I'm going next? Yeah. You know? So it's 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 interesting, which is why I actually think survival really starts not with learning the skills of lighting a fire and building a shelter and what equipment to use and investing in that equipment. It actually starts with your personal skills <laughs> of defending yourself. You know, being able to use a rifle. Yeah, I know that's an extreme example, but it could be the difference between life and death. You know, you put a long barrel in somebody's face, they're going to stop whatever they're doing quite quickly. Yeah, and they're not as difficult to get hold of in this country as people think they are. It's quite easy to get hold of them. Not illegally, perfectly legally. It's quite easy to get hold of those things. Do you have okay, to have, do you have licenses and things like that. There are hoops you have to jump through. But if the government did collapse, then nobody could be coming around checking, are they? Yeah, so there's, there's things like that, but there are ways around those things. And it's not illegal. It is not illegal at all. Farmers all have rifles um, and, and things like that. There are, there are people that you will find in London who wander around with rifles all the time managing deer populations. You just, they're really good at making sure that you don't notice. It happens. So what is it like, join a gun club and then get a license? Yeah, you have to get licenses and you have to jump through the, the Metropolitan Police's hoops and things like that, which is like have a gun cabinet that's bolted to the floor and they'll come around and check where you're keeping it once a year and you have to renew your license and all that kind of thing. But joining a gun club is a good way because also you need to know how to use it as well. And that's number one as well. So that's something to think about. But there's also, well, what happens if you don't have a rifle? Do you know how to defend yourself if somebody comes at you? You know? Could you put somebody in a chokehold and make them unconscious if you needed to do so? Yeah? It's all well and good going, well, if I'm stuck in the woods, I can light a fire. But what happens if you can't get out the end of your street? So those are things that we also need to think about. Survival is not all the Gucci skills of running around in the woods like Bear Grylls, as much of a big idiot as he is. Yeah, and drinking poo from squeezed out elephant dung and all that kind of business. Yeah, which is just gonna make you ill and, you know, end the game anyway because you don't have a hotel to go back to and blueberry pancakes to eat and breakfast the next morning. There's things like that that you need to think about. It's not as Gucci as running around in the woods with an axe and a knife, lighting fires and building dens. So you know? like, most of us have been saving tin food. <laughs> so you're saying like that's not... Tin food goes off and it's not nutritious at all. Sort of like It'll give you, you'll probably last years. about a month. Uh-huh. But after that, you'll start seeing things like scurvy set in, rickets, so vitamin D deficiencies. On food and other stuff like rice and some Rice and things like that. Dried food is always a good one as well. Uh -huh. um, I think probably actually, if we're looking at kind of pop culture references as well, which, which is becoming better. Have you seen The, the Quiet Place? Yeah. 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 There's a very good film. Um, but they did. A, they put a lot of research into how they were going to. It is a post-apocalyptic type film, and they put a lot of research into actually how. I mean, that was a lucky scenario. It's probably unlikely, but you could see that they were learning to can food, pick your foods, and things like that, and grow their own foods. Yeah, that is your best bet. That is where your skills need to lie, because 
saving up tin food doesn't last and it's not nutritiously dense enough that you'll last yeah if you're already a pretty lean person you're going to become very lean very quickly yeah and then this starts going and when this starts going yeah you're done for if you can't think straight it's done but not only that <laughs> but not only that but who's storing water because the taps will stop working quite quickly yeah do you know how to process water do you have abilities to processing water because you don't want to do it chemically because you don't want to be putting chlorine in your water because after a while that's going to stop working that's going to make you really ill yeah like so big Berkey, you put rainwater in there, I think. Yeah, rainwater is great. Storing rainwater as well, but then once again, it's keeping water long term. You store water long term, and it goes off, and that's even worse. That'll, that'll kill you really quickly. Yeah, so it's it's collecting water on the fly and having ways of collecting water on the fly. Can you get it from your local sources? Can you go down to the river and do you know how to process water when it comes from the river? You know, and then what factors do we have of processing water? You know, what is upstream? Because it's all well and good going, oh, this water cut from the mountain stream is wonderful. Look how clean it is. If you don't know, there isn't a dead sheep 400 metres up the uh, thing just rotting away in the, um, rotting away in the water. So this quick water within a matter of days. Water will go off in a matter of days very quickly, especially if it's exposed to sunlight. So a water butt. Not a water butt is sunlight. good, but I mean, I don't know if you've ever collected rainwater in a water butt and then opened it up after a, a month or two. And you can see everything that starts to congeal on the surface. Yeah, because it's rainwater is it's got stuff in it. It's got you know it's got green matter in it, which then creates bacteria and then it just breeds and, and things like that. Little yeah, you know, and then flies get into it and they lay their larvae and things like that. So there is a lot of stuff to unpack when it comes to survival, which is why it's not a one-man job. It's a team effort. You need to have somebody who goes, look, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm really gonna look into how I can look after our water sources and where we can look for our water sources. Somebody else who goes, well, look, we all don't need a rifle, but four or five of us are gonna put the effort into joining the gun club, going through the hoops and getting a rifle, storing the ammunition, storing the weapons, you know? Things like that. It's just, it's, it's very easy for us to watch the telly and, and you know films and bear grills and all those kind of idiots and see that it's all about it's all about running around in the woods but you guys all live in london my treats are in there that's why dense populated area people will turn on each other no. very quickly if it's the difference between life and death yeah so that's something you need to think about it's no good just having a rucksack ready to disappear off to snowdonia You've got to get there first yeah so that's just something to think about enjoy uh no i'm joking so what we're going to look at is we're going to look at some of those skills of what happens it's not my wheelhouse it's not urban survival yeah i can point you in the direction of where you can go to look for weapons and things like that and where you can go especially out here in the countryside I, you know i can name five or six gun shops that you can go to um but it's, it seems like a really extreme thing to think about because we have that culture in this country of oh guns, oh the Americans have got guns and it's always bad in that country. I think you'd be surprised just how many people have weapons in this country, have firearms in this country. Wouldn't even recommend it. Because if you get caught, it's a 10 year instant on the, on the wrist prison sentence, that's it. And then it's game over, isn't it, really then? Yeah, you're done for, it's not worth so there are certain things that I'd say, look, you know, if you're cheeky and you can get away with it, get away with it. But there are certain things that I wouldn't risk. And those are one of the things I wouldn't risk. Yeah. The same as I wouldn't risk wandering around carrying a knife in London for your protection. You get caught, it's five years. There you go. On the, there you go. Enjoy. It's not worth the risk. Yeah. There is still... There is still a, we are still in a civilized society at this present moment in time, and it's, you still have to abide by its laws until such a time as they no longer exist. Which hopefully doesn't happen in any of our lifetimes. But we can't think like that, can we? So we have to prepare either way. All right? Um, so yeah, we're gonna look at some things. We're definitely gonna look at some kit, equipment, and clothing, because clothing is your first line of defense against the elements. And looking at what everybody's wearing today, 
we need to talk about clothes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so we're also going to look at fire. I'm going to get you to light your own fires, whether that be together, individually, it doesn't make a difference. And we're going to look at different methods of lighting fires. Okay? Would have been uh, spent inland. Yeah, in a cave or something like that, in dense forest. Okay? And the summers would have been spent on the coastline. Food is abundant on the coastline, even now. It's abundant. Yeah? There are very few plants that grow on the coastline that are not edible. Very few. All seaweeds are edible. Yeah? There is, uh, there is seafood aplenty. You could drive down to Tilbury. From here, I used to take my students down to Tilbury. The, you know, right within eye shot of the Dartford Crossing. And you could pick up 30 crabs in 10 minutes. Lifting, log, lifting rocks up, pick them in out, put them in a bucket. That's what we used to do. What about all the raw sewage they're pumping into it? Is that not going to affect it? It is going to affect food? it, yeah, but it's something that you're going to have to deal with. But that is going to stop quite quickly, and you'd be surprised how quickly that Thank cleans you. itself out. Yeah? That, that'd be surprised. Don't take the Venice example that happened during COVID as an example. That is bollocks. What was that? The, re the, the, the canals all cleared up in Venice during, the, uh, during COVID. That was because they were pouring cleaning chemicals into the canals. Climate change. That's not where you're going to head to. Yeah, you're going to head to those less populated areas. Devon, Wales, um, the Peak Districts, um, North Scotland, East Coast, West Coast, out to the Isles, those kind of areas. The less populated, the better. But yeah, that's how our ancestors would have worked. So they would have followed the, the rivers inland in the, in the autumn, headed inland. They would have used the summer to prepare and dry and, and keep lots of food. The autumn would have been about collecting berries and mushrooms and things like that. Drying as much of that as they possibly could, the nuts and things like that. Lots of fruit jellies and things. You can take fruits like blackberries, hawberries, um, cherries, things like that, and they would have flattened them out, squished them all out and dried them by the fire. And they go like, um, you know those round trees fruit wind up things? Yeah, they go like that and they last for eight. I've got some that have lasted me years. I made some like 10 years ago, they're still edible now. Because you've removed all the moisture, because moisture is your enemy, yeah? And they go like jerky, and that would have lost them. Lots of nutrition. Then when the spring came round, the sap starts rising, we would tack the birch trees, you've got the fresh nettles, um, all sorts that would have been calorie dense and nutritious, would have brought in. As the, as the spring ended and headed into the summer, they would have traveled down the rivers, fishing as they went out to the coastlines, meeting up with lots of other tribes on the coastlines. That's where babies would be made, you know, all that gathering together. Spent a nice summer getting really fat, ready for the winter on all that, that fatty fish and seafood before the autumn comes round and they start following the rivers back up inland, ready for the babies to be born in the springtime. Do you want to join our group? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's how it would have worked. And we have to think in that, there's a reason we're here, is because that system worked. So we have to know those systems so that we can exploit those systems and use them again. Yeah, coastlines for the summer, dense woodland and mountainous areas for the, uh, for the, for the, for the deep winters. Yeah, because you don't want to be on the coastline during the winter because that's when the weather really turns poop. Yeah, does that make sense? You've also got to unleash that. There is an element of unleashing that violent mindset. Yeah. The reason you've got to be able to say, I will do what is necessary when it is necessary. And that's something really hard for people to get their heads around. Even now saying it in my head, I'm saying, <laughs> you sound really extreme, James. But actually it is. We've seen it in modern examples. Haiti after the earthquakes. Yeah, I have friends who work for international rescues. They go out there after these massive things. And it is like dog eat dog. They're all armed out there. Because anybody will come up behind you and take whatever they can get their hands on when it's necessary. Yeah? Happens in London now. Look at our most deprived areas in London. Why is the crime so high there in our most deprived areas? Well, because it's the spaces where people will do whatever they can in order to make sure that they make it to the next day. And that happens in our, you know, the most, one of the biggest cities in the world, less than 10 miles from here. Yeah? 
it happens. There is still, that human nature is still there. But unfortunately, we've all grown up, you know, with a fairly comfortable background. I can't speak for everybody, but you know, food on the plate, you're all here, you've made it. So your mindset is tweaked towards right and wrong. And when it goes wrong, you need to level that out a little bit and know that you're prepared to do what is not. And it'll even itself out anyway, because if you're not prepared to do what needs to be done, you won't make it. Are there some things you wouldn't do to survive? Is there anything you wouldn't do to survive? Maybe eat your baby. Would you not? I don't think I could. I think I'd rather die. Okay. Then there are lines, yeah, absolutely. But it's not unknown. Then yeah, the baby of course. would die anyway, wouldn't it? Yeah. Hmm? It's not unknown then the for that to happen. The baby would die anyway. It's not unknown because even now for people to, to leave their it. babies. There'll be other people. <laughs> it's not unknown for people to leave their babies out in the cold so that they die slowly because they know that they can't look after them. You know? It's not unknown hmm. for that to happen even, even today. People will deliberately um, uh, allow children to die, newborns to die, because they know that they can't look after them. Yeah, <coughs> people will do what is necessary. Yeah, you say you wouldn't do it. That's you don't fine. Know. Absolutely, you, you don't know. You don't you're know. There. Once again, it's like that conversation where people say, "Oh, well, somebody came with me with a gun. I would do a backflip and kick them in the teeth." <laughs> you don't know how you'd react. You might curl up in a ball and cry. You don't know. You don't know how you'd react. It's, it's unknowable unless you've obviously been in that scenario. Yeah, mm. I can tell you now, being threatened with a knife is a very scary thing been there done that one you know and you certainly do kind of butt clench freeze oh my god and your brain starts racing so quickly you can't think straight yeah then the old oh yeah but then I'm gonna disarm them with a flying backflip and whatever <laughs> yeah no you're not they're gonna stick a knife in you it's that quick boom it's over done I used to have a shop in Brixton and oh, there we go so it reminded me a guy coming is like that guy that uh, was drugged out his brains and he just come in one day like, and pulled out the gun and put it against me head like that. And it was the most scariest thing. And I'm like, ah, yeah, you just what do you want? Like, take me money, you whatever you want. Like, what, yeah, what shop was it? Yeah? yeah? So those are all things. But I do think that there is, you guys also, not, to, not only do you need to think about what you're going to do in this environment and how to survive when that is, you also need to think about the skill. Have you got the skill set to make it through those first days and or weeks? Yeah? Does that make sense? You know, do you have the ability to defend yourself? And, and I, I mean defend yourself hand to hand. Yeah? Most of us don't. Most of us don't. And do you have to be really strong? Yeah, you yeah, don't. Yeah. There are ways of doing so stuff weird. that you don't. <laughs> I mean, obviously when something like that happens and adrenaline kicks in, your strength levels go through the ceiling. And we've got documented evidence of that as well. Mothers picking up cars off children with one hand, you know, oh my God, my child's under the car and picking the car up like that. The, the, your central nervous system is an incredible thing. There's research to say that you are as strong now, right in this second, as you ever will be but it's your brain that's stopping you from doing things that it thinks are not right to do, yeah? If I told you to go and you know, pick up this table with one hand, your brain's going, well, I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna do my back in. But when the adrenaline hits and you're like, oh my God, I need to do this now, the central nervous system shifts the bar so that you can do things. But there are ways around it. I mean, I'm not an expert, but there are ways around. Looking at things like jujitsu, you know, the ability to bend people and break things on people to make coerce them into doing things that you want them to do or stop doing things you don't want them to do or choke people unconscious, yeah? Jiu-Jitsu is a great way of looking at that kind of thing, yeah? Knowing how to, knowing your way around a rifle is another good thing to do. How long yeah? does it take to learn something like that, Jiu-Jitsu? I mean, they say it takes about 10 years of dedicated practice to become a black belt with jiu-jitsu, but you could do, you don't have to be an expert. If you are somebody that is, let's say you've done three months of jiu-jitsu, yeah? And then you come up against somebody who's never done anything like that before, you're immediately a light year ahead of them, mm -hmm. yeah? If you know a couple of stro a couple of chokes and a few um, leg or arm breaking type moves, you know, you're already light years ahead. But also knowing, the, the other thing about those skills, like learning a martial art, and you, you listen to any expert, they'll say that a lot about learning a martial art is not about learning how to use the skills, but it's also about how not to use those skills, about how to, to stay away from those confrontations. But in a 
who hits the fan kind of scenario, those confrontations are going to become, you know, more and more common. You know? Do you think it'd be better to be abroad or in this country? I don't think it would make a difference. Obviously, if, if, if it was solely isolated to this country, then yeah, being in France at the same time would be like, also, ah, we some, that some bullet. Somewhere hot with a local supply chain. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. You're not designed for abroad. You're designed for this country. I'm assuming you grew uh, up here. Yeah, I, I feel like if we had a group of like 20 people and we were in somewhere, you know, that had, you know, five beach. So then let's say, let's say, for example, that you all chipped in, bought a boat and you thought, right, okay, when the poo hits the fan, we're going to shift over to Scandinavia. Totally different bunch of plants. Totally different wind, uh, uh, weather environment that you've never experienced before. Have you ever experienced minus 30 degrees centigrade? Well, I wouldn't go there. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but once again, how do you get yeah. there? Go there before. Yeah, if you can get there before. But then once again, it's a different kettle of fish. You, you know, do you know the plants and the trees of Morocco? You'd have to spend a lot of time there learning those we things. We don't know the plants here and the trees here, do we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at the moment. Yeah, but you would recognise some though, wouldn't you? You know, you'd know a stingy nettle. I mean, if you know a stingy nettle from a stingy nettle, you're already in the right direction. Incredible plant. Absolutely incredible plant, stingy nettle. Yeah? Incredible. And there's a reason it grows so close to wherever there is What's human so population. What's so incredible about it? Hey? What's so incredible about it? It's uh, uh, vitamin A, vitamin D, iron, folic acid. Um, oh God, the list goes on. Um, it's more. It's got more protein in it than broccoli and meat. Yeah. 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 Um, you just, uh, you just take a little bit of it, wave it over the fire, stick it in your mouth. Simple as that. Or boil it up. Yeah. Um, great medi boil, uh, boiling the leaves at the right time of year, really good for stomach injury, uh, stomach um, upsets and things like that. Incredible for stomach upsets. You can make string from it. That's where the name nettle comes from. Is we used to make nets from the fibres that come off the stinging nettle. Yeah. Bramble the same. You can make cordage from bramble as well. Yeah. It's just it's knowing all these things. And once you know one, you go. Oh, hang on a second. I can do that with that plant as well, actually, and then that one, and then it just starts to like go up there. And like I was saying earlier, you learn you learn what a willow tree looks like, and you know that you can survey an area and go, there's a willow there, there must be water in that area. I know where I can get, I can source some water from that space. Because willow, alder, they all love, they need vast quantities of water to survive. So they're gonna be wherever there's large water, water sources. Yeah, does that kind of make sense? Yes, yeah, so it's all, all those kind of things. You don't need to know every plant. You don't even need to know the ones that are poisonous. You just need to know some of the ones that you can eat. And if it's not one of the ones you can eat, you don't eat it. It doesn't matter. Yeah? So it's, it's about looking at things in a different way. Okay? Right, well, that's enough waffles in me. How should we like some fires? Let's like some fires. Come on, Monty.